Kevin down the hallway there. Doesn't it? Okay, so Pastor, no pressure this morning. Sermon can't be really long, you know. It's like <laughs> no foreclosings. We are so glad you're here this morning. If you're joining online, welcome to Tree of Life in Pflugerville, Texas. Open up your mouths, open up your spirit this morning, and begin to thank the Lord. Give him thanksgiving, bless his name. Come on, just open up this morning. We enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise.
you today. <laughs> oh, he daily, he says, I daily load you with benefits. Daily. And he has said, and he's been telling me repeatedly, and he says to you today again, that it is Christmas every day. Every day. And that he is giving you presents every day. And I saw him depositing your presents and giving you the gifts and the things that you've been asking for and things you haven't even asked for. So today is a day of blessing and a day to rejoice and a day to thank him because he is blessing us. Hallelujah.
there's someone here right now that you're having pain in your wrist? Um, yeah, you have a pain in your wrist. And that pain is leaving. You have pain in your wrist. It is leaving right now. He said that he is touching you. It is leaving right now. There's someone that just feels like they're wearing a helmet of headache. And that's the only way he just kept saying, like, he was saying something on my head. He said that is going to be lifted by the end of the service, that as you worship, you're going to feel it go. He said that he is doing things. And as Susan was talking, he's like, I am giving out gifts. I'm giving out gifts of healing. I'm giving out gifts of breath. I'm giving out gifts of living and walking. I'm giving out gifts of peace. Someone has a finger, your first knuckle. That area is hurting. It's going to straighten out. It's going to move right. He said he's healing that. If you have something going on, reach out to him. He still heals. He still saves. He still delivers today.
it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Everybody, just put one hand up in the air, and then I'd like you to envision a gift right where your hand is, and I'd like you to grab that gift and to put it down and to say, I receive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful, O oh God, to be here this day, this Thanksgiving season, Father God, this Thanksgiving week. We bless our families, God. We thank the Lord for our wives, our husbands, our children and grandchildren, friends and loved ones around us. Father, we praise you for the bounty of our nation. We praise you, God, for being faithful to America, to bring forth crops in season, to break drought, O oh God, on the West Coast, to bring forth, O oh God, beauty from ashes for so many families and situations, O oh God, as well. We thank you, Lord, that the pandemic is going backwards. It's being erased, O oh God, off the face of our, of our nation and our states and our cities, O oh God. We praise you, God. You protect your people, God, and bring forth blessings that are beyond measure as only you can do. And Father God, above all this, we thank you for Jesus. 
who shed his blood upon the cross, who died for our sins and gave his life for us, that we might have life eternal in us and through us, O God, that touches, O God, the world around us to share the good news that Jesus Christ is alive and that through him men can be saved. We praise you and thank you, God, your provision, your power, your grace, your glory, your goodness, your faithfulness to your people. We say all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated here today. God bless you. Cheryl's got um, 25% of her voice today. She feels good, but uh, her uh, throat doesn't know, is not working right, so I want to do her part, my part as well. A lot of things are happening here as well. I want to say, first of all, thanks to all the people who came in here and put all these decorations up. We're in this festive season now for Christmas. Uh, God bless Luke and Susan and Christine and all and G and all the other workers that came in here uh, in, during the week here and has worked so hard to get all these wreaths and flowers and, and uh, decorations and lights. Let's give them all a hand here and say thank you for the good work you guys did. We need our volunteers, our helpers, amen. We're also having a Thanksgiving luncheon, of course, today after service, so there'll be some um, smells coming in the sanctuary. It may tempt you to think about Grandma's house or Mama's house, but keep your focus on the Word of God, amen. And uh, it's going to be a, a good time. If you can, join us for the luncheon afterwards. We have food, I'm sure, for everybody that's here. If you did not bring food, you can still stay. And those who brought guests and friends, loved ones, God bless you for that as well. We appreciate you doing that. And uh, I have a few announcements I'm going to give also before I pray for our nation. Um, right out there in the foyer as you leave today, we have our annual angel tree that begins today. We take and we give out gifts to the families of um, children whose fathers are incarcerated, sometimes mothers as well. And every year, you guys have been generous. Every single angel gets taken, and every angel represents a, a gift as well for those children of incarcerated parents. So they're out there in the foyer over here where the uh, Christmas tree is at with Rochelle. She has all the instructions for that, and it says here, um, this is angels you choose from. You buy a present that costs $25 to $30, and uh, please um, pray th play the video for angel trees. So let's go ahead and play that video now. I saw that in my notes as well. Turn the lights down and play the video for Angel Tree. Amen. 1.5 million children have a simple wish this Christmas to feel loved and remembered. When a parent goes to prison, families are torn apart, and all too often children are left feeling lonely and ashamed. The separation can feel even worse at Christmas. With Angel Tree, you could be the hands and feet of Jesus to hurting families in your community who have a loved one behind bars. You could remind children they are never forgotten. And it starts with a gift. Angel Tree volunteers deliver a present, a gospel, and a personal message of love to children on behalf of their incarcerated parents. It's amazing to watch how a gift from that mom or dad can light up their child's eyes and to see the relief on the faces of caregivers. And it starts with a gift. What a testimony of God's love it is to the incarcerated parent when you provide a gift to their child in their name to close the distance between them on Christmas morning. With the help of volunteers across the country, Angel Tree has delivered more than 11 million gifts to children on behalf of their incarcerated mom and dad since 1982. It all starts with a gift. We just like to thank Angel Tree because they helped us. They connected with our dad. Thank you, Angel Tree, for doing all that you do because you don't have to do this, but you choose to do it, and I really appreciate it. Angel Tree is really making a difference in my life right now because uh, I feel like a part of my family. I would like to tell any and every volunteer from the Angel Tree program, thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for what you guys do. For you and your church, Angel Tree Christmas can begin an ongoing, life-giving relationship with prisoners' families. You can help precious children strengthen their connection with their incarcerated parents, grow in their faith, and learn that they are overcomers with great, God-given purpose. Angel Tree is important because it makes an effort to consciously include people, intentionally include people. I know it's real easy for these families to feel uh, left behind and feel like no one cares. It's again, this part of wanting to show tangible love in a way that people actually need. It's, uh, it's helping people where they are in a way that they can appreciate. 
Many Angel Tree churches continue connecting with children and families through year-round ministry, such as Angel Tree camping and church programs, such as Vacation Bible School and Youth Group. Thank you, Angel Tree. Thank you, Angel Tree. You give a gift. Families unwrap hope. What better way to celebrate the birth of Jesus? The greatest gift of all. All right, thanks for that. This is a real blessing to again the children because a lot of times we, we invite their parents to come to the service uh, for Christmas Eve, and so um, sometimes they come to that also to hear the gospel or hear the word of God. It's just a time to encourage them, let them know that the church loves them. Amen. God's people love them as well. Um, there's a few um, dates here because Christmas parties happening. Uh, book club is happening December the seventh. I think that's in two weeks from this coming Tuesday. And it says the youth and the kids will have a party also during the December 19th Sunday service. You can read your bulletin about more details on those as well. Uh, we're having an important birthday, I have one birthday I know about this week uh, with James McMurray. This is son, the wife over here. And James comes when he can with health issues and so forth. But as I prayed about James yesterday, I received Romans chapter 10, verse 8. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And so whatever uh, uh, battles you're going to see your, your husband face next, next year coming up here, remind him that God's word is in him and just use that word. Speak that word. Believe that word. The word of God is near him, in him. It's going to be there to push back the works of darkness as well or bring forth the blessings in God that God has for him as well. Amen. So uh, just get out to him also if you do that. He's probably going to be watching online also. Those that are watching online, uh, my name is Mike Johnson. My wife's name is Cheryl and we appreciate you guys watching here today also. One more thing I want to mention today is we uh, had a sad thing take place yesterday. Charlie Howard went on with the Lord. He had underlying conditions here with um, kidney issues so, and so forth. And so when COVID hit him, it hit him very, very hard. And uh, they could not pull him through that. And so uh, he just passed on yesterday. We don't, we don't have any details yet about memorial services or about funeral services. You might want to show on the screen here. That's on there now. That's what um, Charlie looks like. Those who didn't know his name, perhaps. We're going to miss him a whole lot. This man was always uh, full of joy, full of laughter. He was a great servant, great helper, a great blessing to his wife and so many people in the church. This guy has served not just here, but in churches even before this as well. And I know there's going to be a great, tremendous party in heaven Amen. receiving him because of all the great fruit he bore in his life on this earth. Amen. So those who know Charlie, they know, they know the love Charlie has. They know how blessed God is to have him there face to face as well. But be praying for Evie, his wife, all the family members as well. We're going to all miss him. And so praise God, we're all going to be together, amen, in that great marriage supper of the Lamb in due time. All right? Okay, so also here I'm seeing we have the luncheon. I've got all that thing, thing covered, I believe. I want to have uh, Jack go ahead and take this box, if you wouldn't mind. As you're doing that, I'm going to um, ask, did I miss anybody today having a birthday today or this week coming up? Did I miss anybody? Just wave at me if I missed birthday, folks. I don't have anybody down also for wedding anniversaries. Anybody having an anniversary this week? Let's just take a moment and pray blessings on James. James gets all the blessings, one person. Amen. Let's all pray together. Father, we right now do bless James. We thank you, Lord God, for his life on this earth. We say all the promises for him are yes and amen. We pray, God, that you would um, give him protection, provision, and also, God, favor that he bears even more fruit this coming year than the years gone by. We bless you, God, and thank you, Lord. His life and his light shall so shine before men. They will see his good works and glorify the Father in heaven. We give thanks and praise for him, Father, in Jesus' name. I want to have the ushers, the four ushers, come to the front also and stand on either side of Jack. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting here that Kristen, our children's pastor, came to me about a week ago and said, you know, I really feel that God wants me to start buying some books to help out the children in our church. And, and so I said, well, God told me the same thing about a month ago, and I ordered books for every single parent that's got a child 18 years or younger. So I want all the parents that are here to stand up who have a child, this is parents, that are 18 years and younger. Just go ahead and stand up, and just go ahead and keep on standing. And uh, let me have one of these books here. Um, the book I felt led to get you guys, first of all, is by um, Daniel P. Huerta, this guy's from uh, Dobson's Ministry, and it's on, from Focus on the Family, and it's called uh, Seven Traits of Effective Parenting. It's got just tremendous keys and revelations and just instructions and so forth 
from a qualified author whose name is Daniel Huerta about uh, seven keys to having effective parenting take place in your life. So make sure, again, I want to get four of them right now if I could here for the platform because we have some platform folks behind us. We have, um, you, for have you are raising someone that's um, under 18 years of age. You guys will be perhaps one day. You guys are raising someone that's under 18 years of age. You guys are raising somebody under 18 years of age. And uh, maybe it's... And yes, right, you are raising somebody under 18 years of age. I knew I had four for a reason. And Johnny is too. So make sure Johnny also gets one. For those two ladies right back here, they're going to be blessed by this. Amen? So if you would, go ahead, ushers, and begin to hand those out to the people that are standing up. One per couple, one per family. I only bought, only bought so many. We're not going to charge you guys for these. Uh, they're free of charge. But please make an effort to read them because there's some tremendous truths and wisdom in that as well. And uh, so... The Holy Spirit is really dealing with us about um, pouring into the children of our church, the youth as well. They're facing so many battles. They're facing so much, um, sometimes false things around them. They're trying to bombard and trying to uh, embattle and tear down what God's foundations are. So as I believe our duty as a church, our desire as a church, do all we can to shore them up. Make sure you guys get one too, Sarah and Nate, because you're going to need to read that also. I, mean, I, may, I think I have one for you already. So don't worry about that. The baby's here. Little baby Everly is made it to first time at church, so God bless that. That was a second little granddaughter. We praise God we have two boys, two girls now that are as grandparents. So we reproduce ourselves with three. Now we got four. So God wants you to multiply. Amen? All right. So that's all I, got. All I have to do now. So the ushers are going to come back to the front. We're going to go ahead and receive our offering in the old way where we actually pass the buckets up and down the aisles here because at the end of the service when the luncheon starts, there's confusion, there's motion, there's tables being put up, chairs being dragged around, and folks are not remembering they need to even to give so much. So thank you guys for your faithfulness here as you give today. Um, if you make any checks out, of course, make them out to Tree of Life Church. And uh, we praise God we have, some, and as far as finances go in the church, we have bad news and good news right now to announce from the pulpit this morning. The bad news is our air conditioner, one of them broke down back in the checkerboard room 10 days ago. And because it's an older... 10 year old at least air conditioner it has the old freon the old coolant in that so you can't just replace the coil you got to replace the entire unit inside outside both forty five hundred dollars that's the bad news the good news is we had the money for it we paid cash for it and it's fixed and the brand new one's there because you guys so give yourselves a hand amen because you guys are faithful you guys are generous you guys are being obedient to, to god with a tithe and I want to also say that it's one thing I, I think God may be talking about and saying also because uh, you know, what a nation goes through, a church goes through in many ways. Our nation's going through inflation. And they said inflation's right now about 6% or 8% higher. So now the tithe is now 12%. Did anybody catch that? You know, the, the tithe was 10, now it's 12. No, but guess what? God does not go by man's economy. God says bring the full tithe in the storehouse. It's always been the first tenth of all that God gives us. Amen. It'll always be that way. No matter what inflation does, tithe remains the same. What God is telling us in the Bible in Malachi, if you'll give me the first 10% of all that you're, of your increase, I'll make sure the 90% left over goes further than the 100% would go if you keep it all for yourself. And so we've seen that ourselves. I'm, I could even give our own daughter, Kristen, as an example, as one person I know that how God blessed them in their, in their two transactions for houses. And how God put him in the right place, right time to receive, I, I know, bargains and help and save tens of thousands of dollars just in one, what, one little thing there. I know Cheryl and I, we can, we can talk about our own selves as well, how God has done things to make things not break, to help us find bargains on getting things fixed that do break, and then also just having handfuls of blessings come in on purpose. God's Word says to us, give and it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, so shall men give into your bosom. So the truth is you can't outgive God. And God says, see if I don't rebuke the devourer for thy name's sake in your behalf, if you'll be obedient and give me the first fruits of your increase, says the Lord. I can also, says God, I can pour up windows of heavens for you because you can't even contain all the things I've given to you in your life, in your business, in your sustenance. Amen. So ushers, let's go ahead and come to the, if you're already taking the offering up, well, let's go ahead and let's pray blessings on the offering. Father, we thank and praise you. That you, O oh God, have blessed this church and this congregation in so many ways. We just right now release blessings, God, upon the people of this congregation. They receive, O oh God, favor. They receive raises, bonuses. They receive, O oh God, promotions. They receive ideas and creativity. 
May God find even new places to work if it's your will. But, oh, God, also give them contentment in the job they have. Help us all be thankful for the job you've given to us. If we gripe and complain, God, about our boss and our coworkers, Father, forgive us. Because, Lord God, we know that you put us in places sometimes that are uneasy to test us, to grow us, to mature us. Help us, God, to always by faith give thanks, even in difficult situations, because you're faithful to us. We give praise and thanks, O oh God, for all these things in Jesus' name. Praise God. We can have our uh, youth go ahead and go to be dismissed to upstairs to um, the Pulse Youth Ministries. I think I got everything uh, pretty much covered here. Now, there is no um, Wednesday night service this week because they're having Thanksgiving Eve takes place on this coming Wednesday. Most of us want to be home or travel, and so almost nobody even comes to a service on Wednesday nights before Thanksgiving. So there's no service this coming Wednesday, but in 10 days from now, the next Wednesday after that, we're going to go right back into Go Ye Discipleship Class with Jack Adams upstairs, and we'll also have the one down here with Dr. David Jeremiah, some tremendous um, DVD teachings on that with discussion following that also as well. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to give you guys a, a one-time message here. It's called Thankful for God's Abundance, We're talking about thankfulness and thanksgiving today. And uh, I had some things here I looked up here. I want to do some more, a little more research on history because I didn't realize this, but there actually there were two Thanksgivings in America in one year. The man who birthed Thanksgiving was a man named Governor William Bradford back in the 1600s. Now, many of you know here the pilgrims came from Great Britain, from Europe, during the Reform Reformation because they were escaping oppressive religious systems that were so oppressive, the Queen of England said, if you pray to any other God but me, you'll spend life in prison. I hear it from God, you don't. I hear God's voice, you don't. Don't say you hear God. Don't be praying to your God. Be praying to me, I hear God. And you'll spend life in prison without parole or bail, life, if I find you saying I'm not the one that hears God and I'm not the God of this place. Well, that got very oppressive for them. And then beyond that, they started then going around and taking Christians and cutting off noses, cutting off ears, mutilating their faces and when that took place the puritans finally said this is enough this is too much we cannot handle this we're going to leave this country so they risked their lives and we find that 102 people on the i think it was called the nina or the the mayflower whatever the mayflower came over here and in that very first winter 51 of 102 actually died from the harsh conditions upon the east coast of our nation cheryl and i went to that place called plymouth rock a couple of years ago for the first time to see that. It's a very, very ordinary place, ordinary rock, but extraordinary things happened in that place. You know, of, the, of the 51 folks that died there, there was actually 18 married women among the group of 102. 14 married women of 18 married women died that first winter. The precious women would take and they would lay on their own babies and children to warm them up so they would not freeze to death. And because of that, 14 of them died. Only four made it through the first winter. Their stock of food was so meager, they, their whole family lived on one quarter of a pound of cornbread every day. One fourth of a quarter pounder from McDonald's size patty of cornbread fed them the whole family for one day. They started dying off. They got very, very frightened that the Indians around them would see how many folks were dying. So they always buried their bodies of the dead people in the middle of the night so the Indians could not see how many people were dying, lest they get emboldened and attack them because their numbers were dwindling so much. As that first Thanksgiving takes place, they've now made peace with the Indians. They now share the things together here. Yeah, I understand it wasn't always turkey. It wasn't always uh, chicken. It wasn't always things we get here in America. It was more like roots and gourds and fish, and I don't know what all besides that as well, but they all were grateful that God brought them through, and they were at least alive, and now God was prospering them, and God was going to bless them with a great harvest. But then the next second Thanksgiving takes place in July, the next year. In that time there, they'd gone through now two months of drought, and all their crops were dying. They began to pray and, and, and ask God this. They didn't, they didn't say, oh God, please send rain to us. They said, God, what are we doing wrong that you withheld rain from us? That's the kind of prayer we should be praying today sometimes. Not always begging God to give us, give me, give me, give me, give me, but ask God, what have I done that's withholding your hand from me? When they prayed that prayer, God answered them back prophetically and said, you guys have become too smug and too prideful on your blessings I've given to you. 
You've taken me for granted. And so because of that, I've withheld rain from you guys. And now drought has come. And so they begin to repent of all their smugness and all their pride and all their arrogance of not giving thanks to God every day for his provision on their lives. I mean, folks know whenever God blesses us and increase comes, we tend to be like Israel and forget our God and say, we got enough, we have plenty, who is God? They did the same thing themselves. So they repented and they did that. The next day, clouds appeared over their crops, over their area, and a gentle rain fell for two solid weeks and soaked the ground and watered the crops, and the crops came back. Now, normally in the Northeast, they have a thing called Northeasters, where the wind's real strong, the storms come up, and the rain just pounds down like a hurricane. It was a very soft, gentle rain that soaked in for two weeks. God is good. Amen? And so for our own nation, for our own lives, again, maybe we can learn some things from that to have our second Thanksgiving sometime, because many times God will break through for us, and God will bless us in many good ways. Then we tend to forget who God is by the blessings we, we soak ourselves in, and God will sometimes then start withholding some things from us and say, hey, listen, the blessings you have come from me, not from yourself. And so always give thanks to God. Amen. So we're going to look now at Psalms chapter 103, thankful for God's abundance. The prophetic word that came forth this morning here well as well goes along with this because the word thanksgiving actually means gratitude to God for past benefits. Gratitude to God for past benefits. We give thanks to God on Thanksgiving week and day for past benefits that God's given to us. Amen? And how many folks here are thankful for all the things that God's brought you through in 2021 already? Amen? You got a house to live in. You got a car to drive. You got clothes to wear. You got food to eat. You got freedom in your government, freedom to praise and worship God. There's so many things you take for granted sometimes, and God says it's time to look back and say, thank you, God, for all you've done for me, your many benefits. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5, is the psalmist David praising God for his goodness. And he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all my iniquities and heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your mouth is renewed like the eagles. We thank God for past benefits, but also we thank God for the acts of kindness that God shows to us and gives to us every single day. You know, I'm hearing that word more and more and more, even on the media. The word kindness is coming to me because God wants his people to start operating in more kindness because you've got a whole lot of mean folks all around us. The culture, the pandemic, the things around us, the politics has all brought forth a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, and it's it's about to bring out the worst in people. And you see that yourself in the highways and byways of Austin, Texas, and all around our nation as well. And so God wants the church to counteract that with the love and the kindness of God. When folks are mean to us, we're good to them and nice to them. Amen? When they frown at us, we smile back at them. God wants us to be like that, I believe, more and more in this hour. In the Bible, the word thanksgiving actually is the expression of our thanks for God's faithfulness. The expression of thanks for God being faithful to us. For what God has done, for what God is going to do, it reminds us that God is involved in our lives and God cares about every detail of our lives. Amen? We as humans can easily find ourselves going from problem to problem, from care to care, from gripe to gripe, from crisis to crisis and drama to drama. When you go through things like that, you tend to get self focused. When that takes place, you tend to stop stop giving thanks to God for God's goodness and mercy in your life. All of us have problems, amen? All of us have crises. Let us not be drowned or focused on the crises so much we forget who God is. Because God says we walk through the valleys of the shadow of death, but goodness and mercy always follows us every day of our life, amen? And so whatever bad things you're going through in life, you've got to remind yourself, it's only a valley I'm going through. This does not define my life. And God's going to bring forth beauty out of ashes. And God's going to bring forth something good out of something bad, as only God can do. God works redemptively for us. Amen? Can one of our, can one of our New Year's resolutions for 2022 be this? I am going to be aggressively thankful every day in 2022. Think about that right now. 2022's resolution is going to be for us. I am going to be aggressively thankful in the new year 
in Jesus' name. Every day may not, may not be a good day to you, but every day is a day the Lord has made. So wake up every day if you can next year, starting January the 1st, and give thanks for salvation. Give thanks for God's goodness. Give thanks for God's spirit. Give thanks that God's put your name in the Lamb's book of life. Give thanks you're going to heaven. This is not all there is. Amen? God is good to us. We appreciate him as well. We need to also ask ourselves this question. Are our children and our grandchildren hearing and seeing us giving thanks to God and to others? Are our children and grandchildren seeing and watching and hearing us give thanks to God and others around us? If they're not, let's let them see that. Because those little children are little sponges. And what we do and what we, what we act like, they see that, imitate that, and it programs them for the future as well. We need our kids to be kids of thanksgiving. Amen? Kids of gratitude because that brings forth good things in their lives. There's a promise I want to talk about now. Let's go back to um, Galatians chapter 3. Turn there, Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to read verse um, 16 where the promise begins and is talked about. We're going to deal the whole, entire morning here about this promise that God gave Abraham back at the very foundation of the world. And that promise is still yes and amen today. And that promise has to do with how God blesses us, his children. Again, the word of the Lord came forth already from the platform here about how God's blessings are upon us and God wants to bless us and make every day Christmas. Did you hear that? That's the truth. God wants every day to be a day of blessing and not cursing. The curses have been broken, all right? Galatians 3.16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed. Notice the word seed there is capitalized because it talks about Jesus, capital S. Abraham and his seed, Jesus, were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, little s, as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, capital S, who is Jesus Christ. So the promise was not just made to Abraham. The promise also was piggybacked from Abraham unto Jesus when he was born in a manger and lived 33 years on the earth. The same promise God gave Abraham, God made the same promise to be piggybacked onto Jesus a couple of 4,000 years later on down the road. Now it goes beyond that as well because it says this promise the Father made to Christ in Abraham that Christ was going to be a person full of blessing was embraced by Jesus Christ himself, not just for him, but also for us. Verse 17 says, And this I say, the law, which was 432 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. So the law says, do good and get good. And it says, do bad and get whacked. That's what the law says. Amen. Jesus Christ came, the Bible says, to fulfill the law, supersede the law. He went beyond the law. So the law could not wipe out the promise God gave to Abraham. God went right beyond the law and passed it into Jesus. Jesus Christ fulfills the law and receives the promise that God gives us in this book of Galatians and also back in Genesis as well. Verse 26 says this, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. How many folks here can say with a hand raised up, I am a son or daughter of God, I'm born again? Most of you. Those whose hands are not raised up right now, there'll be an altar call at the end of the service. You can come to the front, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But the truth is, the Bible says all those that are born of God are called sons of God. Okay? So you're a son of God. Anybody can become a child of God. Praise God for that. All those who come to Christ, call upon Jesus, can become saved. No matter what you've done in life, whether you're watching online right now or you're here in the sanctuary, you could have been a Satanist, a hell's angel, a prostitute, a drug addict, a murderer, a mass murderer. No matter what you've done in life, no man, no woman who calls upon Jesus Christ's name will not be saved. There's no sin too big that God can't forgive. And God takes sin from us, but God also comes in people's hearts and lives who ask Jesus Christ to be their Lord and be their Savior. He's no respecter of persons. And I thank God that God is like that because God takes folks like Saul and turns him into Paul's. And Paul does great exploits with God's grace and God's goodness in his life. So verse 29 now says this, if you then are Christ, if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Notice the word seed here is singular. 
And the word heirs here, it means the promise is in our possession. We are heirs of the promises God spoke to Abraham thousands of years ago. And those things are promises that are still alive today. Amen? How many folks realize the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the Word of God is living and active like a two-edged sword. And the Word of God, the Bible also says, will not return void, but will accomplish everything God wants it to accomplish. So when God spoke words of anointed words and promised words to Abraham thousands of years ago, they are still alive today through Jesus Christ. And though the same promise that God gave to Abraham that goes on to Jesus now comes on to us. We're going to talk about this promise now in a moment. Let's go now to Genesis chapter 12 to see what the promise actually is. What was the promise that was so spectacular, that was so amazing, that God gave it to his own son through Abraham thousands of years before, before Christ was even born on the earth. He gave the promise to him. we got to catch this thing because prophetically, again, I'm already hearing God giving me a series for 2022. I, I hear God saying to me very clearly, very plainly, that next year is going to be a year of favor. God is going to start increasing favor on the body of Christ. God's going to start causing your co-workers and your unsaved neighbors and friends and, co and people around you that are lost to suddenly start looking at you and watching you and liking what they see. Then the favor of God will be on you to draw, drawing people to the Christ in you. Not to you, but the Christ in you. Amen? So be uh, postured for that, prepared for that. They don't just need your money and stuff and things and goods. They may start with that, but they need the Christ in you. The hope of glory. Amen? They need the hope of glory to be manifest in their lives because they need the glory of God in them. So Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 says this. The Lord said to Abram, his name had not been changed yet, to Abram. Now there's, there's conditions. I also know there's conditions to every promise God gives us. You realize that? It says, you shall be saved if you call upon the name of the Lord. And the Bible says again and again, I'll do this if you do this. Every promise has a condition in the Bible, and so does this promise as well. So God gives a condition first. The Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, into a land that I will show you. So what's God saying here? God is saying, you got to first of all, get out of your culture, out of your kingdom, out of your fleshly world around you into God's kingdom. You got to leave this world system and go and buy into God's system. Get out of this kingdom of darkness and go into God's kingdom of light. That's what God says. So we got to get out to get in, okay? The promise will not be ours if we find ourselves trying to dabble in both kingdoms at the same time. You can't serve two masters, amen? You're going to love one, hate the other, hate one, love the other. You cannot serve two masters. A divided person is wavering in all of his ways, unstable in all of his ways, and he obtains nothing. The Bible says he obtains nothing. Amen? So we got to get out to get in. So moving on. I will then make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. Tell your neighbor you are blessed. Because it's true. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Amen? That includes, again, your neighbors, your loved ones, your friends around you, all the unsaved folks you know. They'll be blessed because you're blessed. And God wants us to understand today, Thanksgiving week here, we are a blessed people. We are not cursed. We're under God's blessings and goodness. Amen? So, there's four things about this promise before I end the service and have some turkey and some gravy. And they said, don't go real long today because you guys are hungry. But the good news is it's, we're getting done by 1130 anyway. So you folks are going to be fine. Focus today. Focus on the Word of God, the message of God. And we'll feed ourselves later on in the natural realm. But number one is this. The promise is number one is this. We are blessed. I just, we just said that. We are blessed. Amen. This passage is full of the word bless. Again and again, the word bless is in Genesis chapter 12. We just read those verses. God blessed Abraham, and then God blessed Christ through Abraham. And then the Bible says God then also blessed the seed of Christ, which is also you and me. 
So it piggyback from Abraham to Jesus to us. Because Christ is blessed, we are blessed. Because we are joint heirs with Jesus. And that blessing took place not just for Jesus, but also for us today who are called Christians, little Christs upon the earth. This reality is going to change your life. It's going to change the way you think, the way you eat, the way you live, the way you perceive people around you and things around you. The way you see your workplace, the way you see your life needs to be changed to understand everything you have is blessed. It may not look like it, but it's blessed because God says it's blessed. Many things that look real bad and look real uh, dark and, and whatever else, they're actually blessed. And God put them in your path because they're a blessing for you in the long run. We don't need to take and beg for blessings. We have blessings already. We need to be thanking God we are blessed. Don't beg God to get blessed. Thank God you are blessed. Amen? Did you catch that? Don't beg and pray for blessings. Thank God I am blessed and I'm full of blessings. And I'm going to be a blessing, a bigger blessing in the, in the months and years ahead as well. Receive it by faith. Number two is this. Second part of this promise is this. We are also a blessing to others. That's what God wants you to get a hold of today as well. We're a blessing not just for ourselves, but also to others. How do people know that we are God's children? They know it because God blesses us, then they see us blessing others. They will know you are Christians by your love. Love always demonstrates giving something out to folks around you who sometimes don't even deserve it and didn't even earn it. So God blesses us to be a blessing. When we see God's blessing upon, upon us, people see that. They start getting inside of their own lives, a testimony of thanksgiving saying, look what God did for them. God may also do that for me. But also as God blesses us, our hearts also get full of thanksgiving. When your heart's full of thanksgiving, the Bible says, enter into his gates with what? With thanksgiving in your heart. What that means is when there's gates that are shut in your life of healing, provision, peace, joy, whatever, the, the key to opening those gates up is thanksgiving. Enter into the gates with thanksgiving in your heart. I preached to you guys months and months ago a message where I said, uh, the five loaves and two fishes shows us we give thanks to God for what is never enough, that it might become what is more than enough. I want to say that again. You thank God in advance for what is never enough, five loaves, two fish, 5,000 people. And then by doing that, you're giving thanks and faith for what should end up being more than enough. How many of us realize that God gives you more than you ask for? When God told the fishermen named Peter, James, and John, cast your nets on the other side and get a catch of fish, because they, they let him use his boat to preach in. So to pay him back, he said, Cast it on the other side. They obeyed Jesus, and the Bible says one ship of Peter's was totally filled up to the brim. They brought the other ship also next to him, and the other ship also got filled to the brim. And it says the boats began to sink. What that means is God will take and fill you up to your capacity. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will God give you in your capacity. And that's one word I'm going to preach about next year as well is the word capacity. God wants to increase your capacity. Some of you guys have got things that God wants to give to you, but you cannot contain it yet. You can't contain what God wants to give you. So God's going to increase your wine, your wine skins, and God's going to increase your ability to, for capacity in your life, your marriage, your peace, your, your, your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding is all going to increase as you're a person of gratitude and thanksgiving. Thanksgiving unlocks an, an enlargement for capacity in your life to enlarge and receive more from God, okay? When we recognize again God's blessings, God gives thanksgiving to us. There's nations around us, and there's things happening around us that are very, very negative right now. There's so many visuals and so many audibles happening around us every day that are negative that it seems like very easily we're actually more cursed than we're blessed. You can look at the world scene right now and say, well, there's nations that hate us. Russia hates us. North Korea hates us. The Muslims, some of them guys hate us as well. You can look also at the different parties that rule our nation. You say, well, my party does not rule Texas. My party does not rule America as president. You might look at things like saying, well, there's global warming going on. The whole world is going to be rising up in, in all kinds of hurricanes and tornadoes and so forth. That's all a great big curse on the whole world. 
You might be looking at, looking at inflation, looking at the way folks drive around you in Austin, Texas, and you're saying, I see myself cursed more than blessed. Well, the problem is your focus is on the wrong thing. Your focus is on the world and the world culture and the world scene and the people of the world. Amen? Get your focus off what the devil's doing, off what man's doing. Get your eyes on what God is doing. Because God's doing more things of blessings than the world's doing of cursings. Amen? You are not cursed. You are blessed. You may be in a cursed, fallen world, but you're not cursed. You are not of the world. You're in the world. You're of Jesus Christ and His kingdom. And His kingdom is not cursed. His kingdom is blessed. And you're of His kingdom. You believe that? Five folks believe that. Before I get done today, you're going to all believe that. We're going to say it until 1.30. Okay, let's keep on moving. Now, when Satan, when Satan rebelled against God in Isaiah chapter 14, Satan does the same thing here as he did, does even today. What does Satan do? Satan projected to God verbally and visually the five things that are, that are God's biggest nightmare. Tried to scare God, tried to intimidate God, and tried to get God to see how much cursings he's going to bring on his life. What does Satan say? Satan said, I'm going to rule in heaven, Isaiah 14. I'm going to rule over all the angels. I'm going to rule over all the believers on the earth. I'm going to rule over the entire earth system. I'm going to become equal to you. That's the five things that Satan told God he's going to do. That's God's biggest nightmare is Satan doing all those things. Now, what did God, what did God do? Did he shudder and shake? Oh, don't do that, please. Don't do that. No. No, he snapped his finger, and in one millisecond, Satan would find himself down like a, like a bolt of lightning on the earth, judged by God, condemned by God to be upon the earth and never be in heaven again the rest of his being upon the whole times of eternity. You see, God knows I'm not cursed. I don't get intimidated. I don't receive what Satan tells me. I don't receive projections that Satan gives me. Satan does the same thing today to you and me. He tried doing to God thousands of years ago, and that is he tries projecting the worst case scenario into your minds on a daily basis. He finds out the worst case scenario, tries to make you see yourself, your marriage, your finances, your health in some bad light that you might believe the curse and not the blessing. You got to shut down the projections of Satan that he gives to your mind, shut those down and replace him with God's projections, God's vision, God's word, what God says. Because God comes to bless, Satan comes to curse. Amen? Choose life, reject death. That's what I'm saying. Number three is this. We also have future blessings and God's favor is what the promise tells us. We have future blessings and God's favor. This is what the word promise actually means in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. It means if you've lost the expectation of, in your life of future promises, God can give it back to you once again. Some folks in this room right now today watching online, you've lost hope in something that God wants you to re restore hope back to you in that area. Whatever that place may be, God's the God that restores hope and restores joy and restores peace and restores everything Satan steals from us. If we just walk in thanksgiving for things we don't have even yet by faith. We need to be careful, but not fearful. Amen? Be careful in this world. Watch your kids. Watch what they eat, watch what we eat, watch where we walk, watch what we do, watch what we do and say and so forth. But don't be fearful. Be careful, don't be fearful. Fear must not grip our minds and hearts because fear has torment. Let's have more faith in God's blessings, God's future, and God's goodness than we have in what Satan can do to us in the future. Believing that you're blessed is not arrogance. It is believing what God says. Believing you're blessed does not make you prideful and arrogant and selfish. It means you believe the Word of God for yourself, because God says you're blessed. You're blessed to be a blessing. Amen. If you're not selfish, blessings are good. Blessings are for those around you, not just yourself as well. We don't pray to be blessed. We pray to be a blessing. This is the purpose of God's blessing, is to bless others around us. We're also blessed to make the lives of others better around us. In the Hebrew language, the word blessing others carries with it the meaning, you'll be an instrument of divine favor 
and will be able to prevent misfortune in your life and people's lives around you. You'll be able to prevent misfortune in your life and the lives of people around you because your blessing will become their blessing. Cheryl and I have seen misfortunes diverted from us time and time again because God's grace and favor and blessings are on us. I've seen God do the same thing for folks in this congregation. I've seen God also bless this whole church here for misfortunes could have come, but God intervened and God turned the misfortune around from misfortune to fortune. Not missed fortune, but fortune. Amen. We missed the misfortune. It was gone. Amen. God is good. An example of this is, you know, Cheryl, her precious uh, sister died. What about, it's been like four or five years now, huh? Three years ago. Name Ann. We visited Ann before she died about, about five years ago. We was in South Africa. And uh, on a Sunday morning, her health was not very good. She couldn't walk very good. She had bad ankles, bad knees, and could not get around. So we was going to a town, Zulu township to speak and preach at a church I worked with when I was a missionary there. And so we took um, Ann's husband, Robert, and, and Cheryl and myself all went to the Zulu church on a Sunday morning. Well, that Sunday morning, that Satan being the devil he is, made sure some robber thief guy and killer jumped the fence of the compound where she lived at. She lived in a, in a place that was, that was for folks who are 55 years and older in South Africa. Kind of like duplexes side by side, a great big place. This guy um, somehow came to where Ann's house was at. She was by herself. And I think her door was even unlocked. She was standing on the porch, and the guy was going to come to her, and the guy had a knife, and the guy meant to take and, eat and kill and rob or both. But for some reason, something took place with God's intervention, and he goes to the neighbor lady next to her, who's also single and elderly, and she goes to hell on earth. That, that, uh, that guy attacked her. He tried to stab her. She somehow diverted the, the knife off herself. He got her into a pen, and she said, take all my jewelry, take all my stuff. She gets all of her stuff together, her jewelry and so forth. He puts her clothes on himself because when they leave the compound, there's guards that are there as guards leaving and coming and going in the place. And so he says, I want you to get in your car now. I got a knife in my hand. I'll, I'll cut your throat if you tell these guards who I am. He's got her clothes on like a woman. And so they go out the gate. He's got all the jewelry in a bag. They drive about, what, about four, 200, 300 feet down the road. Happens to be a police roadblock two or 300 feet down the road. And when the roadblock happens and the car stops, the little old lady somehow jumps out and yells, this guy's a thief. And all of a sudden the, the police jump on him, tackle him, pin him to the ground, arrest him. And she's got scratches, bruises, PTS, the whole deal, the rest of her life. But she made it through that. All of those things would have taken place to Ann Gray, her sister. But somehow God diverted misfortune off of her door, and it came to the person next door, their door instead. So the good news was her life was spared. The bad news was the police stole her jewelry anyway. The police did. How many folks are glad you live in America? For the police don't, the, most police don't steal your jewelry when they rescue you. Amen. What I'm saying is time and time again, God differentiates godly, righteous people from the ungodly. And misfortune comes on sometimes them, not us. We don't want that, pray for that, or hope for that. It just happens and takes place that way many times. Last of all, number four, a grateful heart creates a servant's heart. A grateful heart creates a servant's heart. We've been blessed to have so many people in this church who serve. Last week we had Connection Sunday, I think it was, and so many of you folks stayed behind and signed papers and said you'll serve yourself. We've been so blessed at Tree of Life Church to have so many good people who understand what it means to serve others, to serve God, and serve with gratitude. We appreciate you guys so much. Amen. They know they're blessed. They want to bless others. That's why folks that are grateful will serve folks with no griping, complaining. They love to serve. The blessed mindset de uh, defeats the saying that says, What's in it for me if I serve? That goes out the window. They start serving because they love people, they love God, not what's in it for me. We get our eyes off our, of our needs and notice the needs of others when we serve with the mind of Christ, the attitude of Jesus. If you want to know if you had a successful life, ask yourself this question. At the end of your life, would people call you a servant when you die? 
Charlie Howard, who died yesterday, all of us who know him can say that man was a servant. We know Charlie not by how big his house was, how big his bank account may be, how big his car was, or whatever else is all natural things. We know Charlie by his love and his servanthood upon the body of Christ. That man served at Shoreline Christian Center. That man served here. That man served faithfully all of his life. He served the military. He served our nation. He put his own body in harm's way. He's an example of a servant's heart who served out of a love for God and people and not for himself. As Greg comes back to the platform to help me out here, please, Greg, I want to say one last thing. In God's kingdom, you're not great because of what you have or because of your title, what you accumulate, how many degrees you get or awards that man gives you. You're great because you serve the body of Christ and you serve God. The Bible says if you want to be great in my kingdom, learn to be a servant of all. As you close now in prayer, I want to pray for all those that are watching online, those that are here today. The main thing is today, the main question to ask before we ask ourselves, am I a servant or am I blessed? You cannot be blessed by God's goodness unless God has control of your life. And you might say to yourself, I don't want anybody controlling me. I don't want boundaries. I don't like rules. I don't like regulations. I don't like anybody telling me what to do. I am my own man, my own woman. I don't need anybody or anything. Well, the truth is that that's a total lie from the pit of hell. All of us need boundaries. All of us need rules. All of us need regulations. The good news is God's boundaries are not burdensome. God's rules are not confining. God's regulations and God's plan for our lives is not to ruin our lives, but to bless our lives. The Bible says when Jesus Christ comes in our life, He gives us life, this life more abundant than we had before. We never, ever, ever go backwards in God. Now, God may give us new problems of sometimes persecution, misunderstandings, and folks rejecting us, but even there, God's grace is sufficient for us to withstand that and receive also His joy and peace and righteousness in every situation. The main thing is today, we need, we need to ask ourselves, first of all, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you ever asked Jesus inside your heart? Have you ever bowed your knee and bowed your heart in submission to God and said, Lord God, I realize I cannot save myself. And so Lord, this day, I ask you, come in my heart, be my God, be my Lord, be my Savior. I accept your Son, Jesus Christ, in my life today. Father, I pray also, and I allow Jesus, I allow you, O God, to take sin from me. And I say, take all the things, O God, of filthiness from me, but as far as east is from the west. Write my name, O God, in the Lamb's book of life. I say, O God, this day I am your son, I am your daughter. I now belong to you, Father. And I want to follow you all the days of my life. And I want to promise you, if you make a prayer like that or say a prayer like that, God always hears that prayer. And God answers that prayer. And God's Spirit will come inside of you. And you're going to find there's going to be a peace. There's going to be a joy. There's going to be a contentment you've never experienced before. I'm not saying all your problems are gone, your eyes are healed, your glasses are gone, and your arthritis is finished. And I'm not saying all things are all gone that are bad. What I am saying is the God who made the universe, the God who raised His own Son, Christ, and the dead, makes that Spirit live inside of you. He comes inside of you to only better your life. And he says, little by little, I'll possess the land of your heart. And I'll make your life worthwhile. And I'll show you the purpose you have to be alive on this earth. And I'll unfold the plan I've had for you from the foundation of the earth. If you'll just give your life to me, says the Lord. If you pray that prayer today and you're watching online, or you're here today perhaps, and you want to pray that prayer for the first time, make sure we know that. Send us a, a text, an email, a telephone call, and somehow, some way, get a hold of us. We have a book to give to you by Jack Adams also about what is next, what do we do next. Because once you are saved, it's time to go ahead and start working towards being discipled for Christ. And see what God requires, what does God want. And find a local church, a place to get fed, nourished, encouraged, and hear the Word of God. I'm going to all, just, let's all stand to our feet now. I'm going to have the prayer partners go ahead and come to the front here for a moment. We're going to be having a time here pretty soon to tear down all the chairs and get the tables out with all the food. And thank you guys so much for being generous today to bring in 
your delicious desserts and food and all the things you guys brought. We're going to partake of that in a moment. We want to have you guys have an opportunity also to get prayed for this morning. Do you have any needs at all in your life or you want to be prayed, be prayed for to receive Jesus Christ into your heart? Please make your way out of your seats before we tear this place up and find a prayer partner here to pray with you a prayer of agreement that God may heal, that God may deliver, that God may provide, that God may help someone that needs prayer if it's not here today that you want to pray for. Also on your bulletins, there's a place to fill out prayer requests. Please fill those out. Put those in the offering buckets at the back of the, of the room as you leave today as well. I think I've covered everything I think is important. I'm going to let Christian come and give us instructions as far as all the details go for this luncheon. And God bless you folks again. We don't see you beyond today. Have a great Thanksgiving. Enjoy your family time. We're praying for traveling protection for you guys coming and going. And may laughter just fill your home. Remind yourself every day, I am blessed. And I am blessed to be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Kristen. All right, good morning. We're glad you guys are with us today. Thank you so much, sound folks. They put up the um, the picture that we've made for today to help us understand where, where and where everything goes. Um, so we're just going to give a little bit of instruction. So when we're all done, they're going to play some music, and we're woo woo, all work together to get all the chairs moved as a team. Um, as you'll see, the um, all the serving tables are going to be here. So that's kind of the main thing is once everything is set up, which we do pretty quickly, just know that there are two lines, and on each table are all the same thing. So you're not going to miss out. So you can make a line here and a line in the back. That way we get through quicker. And all the desserts are going to be in the new lobby there. Um, two more real quick announcements. We are going to be putting up some really awesome outside decorations. So uh, can Alex wave at me? Is Alex here? I don't know about. He may be setting up. His wife, Gabby's right here. She can wave at me. Um, she can direct you to Alex later. He needs help this Saturday. If you're available at 10 a.m., he will be outside putting up outside decorations if you're available. And also this Tuesday, I have a luncheon at 10. If you are interested in helping with our Mother's Day Out luncheon, let me know. All right, so we will dismiss you guys. If you needed prayer at this time, um, you can come up here, and I'm going to dismiss him. There's Alex. That's what Alex looks like. <laughs> there he is. Um, I'm going to dismiss and pray. We're going to pray for the food. Thank you to all the volunteers who have put up this together, especially the Pittmans have worked very hard, and uh, we're going to pray for the food. So, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Sunday service. God, I pray that you would help us have hearts that are just full of gratitude and thanksgiving this year, um, especially this year as folks get together, um, those that, that have been far apart. We thank you for that, God. It really, truly is a gift. Um, thank you for our church family, for our families and our friends. We pray for this food that will be blessed to our body and that this time that we have together is just going to be amazing as we make connections and we say how thankful we are for one another. In Jesus' name, amen.